Welcome to the Wilson Sonsini and Taylor Wessing webinar, the most entertainment form of social distancing. Hello, I'm Graham Han and I lead the video games practice at international law firm Taylor Wessing. And I'm really excited about this webinar as we have two incredible panelists from major brands in the sector. Hi, I'm Chris Panieski. I'm a partner in the technology transactions group at Wilson Sonsini and I support clients in various stages of development and in various industries. And I am particularly excited to be participating in today's webinar. Um, since th video games are near and dear to my heart, they formed a large part of my childhood. And even this past weekend, I was able to play Last of Us Part Two a little bit. So I'm really excited to be uh And I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Don McGowan who's general counsel at Bungie, uh, the developers of not only Destiny, but Destiny 2. And prior to May 2020, Don was the chief legal officer um, and of business affairs at the Pokemon Company International, where he oversaw all worldwide business and legal affairs for the company and was the producer on the summer of 2019 movie, Pokemon Detective Pikachu, which opened number one worldwide. And he lives just outside of Seattle, where now it's very early in the morning for him, and he just celebrated a birthday yesterday. This so is true. Nikki Ormrod has headed up the legal team at Sega Europe for the past 13 years. Her team looks after legal and business affairs for Sega in London, and development studios Creative Assembly, home of the Total War franchise, Sports Interactive of Football Manager fame, Relic Entertainment, Amplitude Studios, and Two Point Studios. Prior to arriving at Sega, Nikki was legal counsel at Hit Entertainment and Guinness World Records. Not a gamer herself, she is nevertheless experiencing a ridiculous amount of lockdown Minecraft, courtesy of her children. I guess, you know, we're all in lockdown in this surreal situation that's been going on for the last few months. It's great to hear a little bit about how it's affected your roles, your teams, and, uh, you know, your business. So I wondered, how is the the coronavirus, the related government shutdowns in the US, UK, and obviously everywhere else, alter your expectations for 2020? Have you had to alter or, you know, how's it played out? I guess maybe I'll start with Nikki. Yes, thanks, Graham. Um, yes, we um, moved quite quickly into a remote working scenario. Um, I guess we benefited in some ways from seeing what was happening at head office in Japan before really things started to move into lockdown in the UK. So we had a little bit of forewarning and what that meant for the organization. Um, so, you know, we're lucky we all work in technology anyway. So I think we were well placed to, to pivot quite quickly and um, had the technology and the know-how in place to really um, make the most of, of that short turnaround. I think for the business, certainly in Europe, where we saw the, the biggest pivot um, in the last couple of months was how to reorganize our events calendar quickly, um, trying to make the most of the, um, the advantages that we had to be able to showcase what we had coming up online. Um, a lot of the big gaming events happen in the spring and the summer, and they really are set pieces for the industry. The trade shows where we you know, highlight all our next releases, where we network, and where all our business development takes place. So I think that was a big challenge and that took a lot of creativity on the biz dev teams and also the marketeers to try and work out how to do that, how to reach the same audiences in better ways and connect. Um, and we're lucky that our audiences are primarily online to start with. Um, so that really was the, the big initial shift. And, and I think, you know, all in all, it's worked well. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're a large publisher um, so I think it's the small, medium-sized developers, the startups that really, I think, would have felt the pinch from not being able to go to E3, Gamescom, and, and, and the rest, because they're the ones that get the most out of these networking opportunities. Um, so I think that's a shame. I think we'll see fallout from that um, as we go through the, you know, the, the coming months. But, but yeah, I, th I like to think that we have been resilient um, in the face of, of, of the global challenges, but also, you know, not just our industry, but everything that fell away when live events stopped taking place. Yeah, great stuff. Thank you. Sean, how, how has this affected you and Bungie? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I have a somewhat unusual perspective because I've seen uh, 
I've seen the weirdness from inside two companies. Um, I, I decided to take the opportunity to change jobs during the middle of all this, uh, which is an interesting decision I would give you. Um, at Bungie, we're fortunate, uh, you know, we're, we're a lot smaller than Sega, obviously, um, but uh, we're fortunate to have, first of all, a very robust uh, title already in the market, and secondly, a very robust uh, community of players who kept, uh, kept the, the community alive throughout the weirdness. Um, the third thing that I think I would point out is we've benefited from the fact that Destiny 2, our game, is <clears throat> what I call a game played at a distance, uh, where it's, it's, you know, it's an online game, it's a, it's a first-person shooter MMO, um, and so that game very much is unimpeded. In fact, it, you know, the, for people staying home, that's kind of the, you know, the target for our game is people staying in their home and playing the game. Um, as you know, we're not a we're not an entity that requires a lot of activity uh, outside of the house. When I was at Pokemon, it was a slightly different conversation because we actually had Pokemon World Championships scheduled to be in London in August this year, uh, which obviously has had to be canceled. Um, and so, you know, the the absence of people going to places and doing things affected that company a lot more than Bungie. And it must have affected, I guess different parts of the business in different ways. And Nikki, I know you look after a fair group of businesses. So, you know, the effect on development different to the effect on, obviously, the, you know, the front line in, in terms of the folks that would go to GDC or, 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 or Los Angeles missing those conferences. You know, how has this affected different parts of the business differently? Yeah, that's right. I mean, um, so my team looks after sort of the legal business affairs for seven studios um, in Europe and and in Canada. Um, and I think the experience has been different in each one. But one of the common threads is um, a knock a knock on productivity from the devs. Um, you know, different teams react differently to to being able to work in silos, um, and others are affected more broadly by that lack of collaborative scrum chat um, that they thrive on in the development studios. Um, so I think I think that's where we're seeing a pinch, and obviously that has an impact then on DLC um, drops um, and product pipeline. Um, but it's manageable, you know. I think I think there is there is a little hit on productivity, but the teams are ever inventive to try and find ways to get around that. Um, but I'd say that's a common thread in the development studios. And then just the other observation is obviously, you know, we're, we're part of a, a multi, multinational but multifaceted business with headquarters in Japan. And and we are sort of, we had a good year last year in the consumer products business is where Sega Europe sits. Um, but other parts of the business have, have really been impacted because they rely on amusement centers, resorts, casino businesses, et cetera. So, you know, overnight their business has, has dried up. So... There's a real sense of, you know, we're all in this together and, and each business unit has been asked really to try and pull together and, and support other parts of the business, which, which are going to see a much longer tail coming out of this. So, yes, there's, there's definitely a, a range of, of reactions and an impact. And what's been the most, you know, if, 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 if there's one thing you could put your finger on that, hey, I never expected that to come out of the lockdown of, the, of, of this situation. Um, you, you know, what was the, been the most surprising thing um, for you? Um, I think it's the resilience, actually. Um, the resilience and adaptability. I mean, you know, we, we pride ourselves as an industry as being agile anyway. But I think for me, it was in the face of a global pandemic where everyone is pretty much brought down to a very basic level of, of survival in many ways. Um, it's an emotionally traumatic event. Um, and that follows through in all sorts of our personal and business lives. For me, it was the resilience with which actually, whether it's our partners or um, the marketeers thinking about new ways, like I said, to, to bring or make sure that our games can still be showcased on on, on different channels and the same channels. Um, that surprised me. And I, I think as lawyers, we were, you know, we're bombarded on a daily basis by the worst case scenario in terms of contractual relationships breaking down, litigation flowing from, you know, force majeure events, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, I, th and I remember at the beginning of lockdown, that was very much a focus for us, was how we were going to cope with this sort of tsunami of breaches and, and uh, 
inability to perform contracts. And we just haven't seen that happen. Um, and instead, we've seen a much more um, a risk sharing approach being taken by our partners um, across the board, actually, um, and an acknowledgement actually that this risk is to be shared and to take mitigating steps to, so that we can all emerge on the other side um, pretty much intact. So that has surprised me, actually. Well, it's good to hear that the outside council are not the beneficiaries of the lockdown. So that's good. Um, for once, yeah. yeah for once. <laughs> John, you know, apart from getting up at four o'clock in the morning to join a webinar about a global pandemic, what's been the most surprising, uh, you know, surprising aspects of this for you? Um, I would say that one of the more surprising aspects has been, you know, I want to echo what Nikki said, the spirit of partnership that you're seeing from uh, from people that you've done business with, um, <clears throat> you know, it's it's certainly uh, you, you you can't necessarily hope that your business partners are going to, um, and so seeing that has been very uh, you know rewarding and and also has been you know a little reassuring. Um, Nikki used an expression that I stopped myself from from using, which is on the other side of this. Um, I'm actually personally of the opinion that. We might be seeing, we might be in a, a, a moment of significant societal change um, that we don't necessarily know how to respond and how to react to. Um, <clears throat> I think at that point, you know, if we are in a moment of significant societal change, the idea of being in a business that's undertaken at a distance will be something that's helpful for those of us who are in that business. Yeah, I guess nobody would have predicted that. Um, and just, just, just one more thought from me, and then I, I, I will hand over to Chris. Um, if you guys had to do anything different, knowing what you know now, three months into this, is there something you would have done that you didn't, or you wouldn't do that you did? You know, you know, looking back on those first few days and weeks of lockdown, Don, why don't you, you, you go first? Sure, I'll hop on that. The, one of the things that I've been telling people at Bungie is uh, we need to remember now that every conversation has to happen on purpose. There's no, oh, I ran into you in the hallway conversations. Um, and, you know, having been, having run legal departments for, for 12 years, you know, I can, I can say that the amount of things that I learned by osmosis or by people running into me in the hallway and telling me something uh, were fairly significant. Uh, none of that sort of spontaneous interaction happens anymore. And so the thing I would do differently <clears throat> is I would go go back in time and set, I'd get in my DeLorean, drive back, you know, Doc Brown would, would, would give me the plutonium, and I would set up some more recurring conversations with certain people that I now know know things that are useful for me to know. Yeah, great stuff. Nikki? Yeah, I mean, if only we could go back and do that. that I mean, I echo what Don said, really. Um, I mean, hindsight's a wonderful thing. But um, one thing we've we've found when we've um, surveyed our staff during lockdown to see what their, their feelings are and what they feel is working and, and not working is, is the level of engagement with other business teams within the business. So, you know, you know, the legal team, it actually suits us quite well at home. We can get our heads down. We, we can do the hours on the drafting and the focus time. But what we really miss is is the the ability to sit next to the devs and really understand what they want and what they're doing actually and that communication's been lost I, i'm not sure how we could do it differently at the outset but i um, i think maybe if we had done something differently we might have uh been able to anticipate that this is going to go on longer than than we thought at the beginning and therefore could have built in a way to, like like Don says, have that spontaneity um, of communication. I don't know how you achieve that. I mean, um, but, but I think that's what's missing. It's certainly the, the ability to sound check your ideas to see if your advice fits against actually what the business is sometimes trying to tell you in a, in a highly technical way. Well, it certainly could, I guess, fundamentally change the way we communicate within business. Um, Chris, I, I think you were going to take the next question. Yes. All right. So during the shutdown, we actually saw a lot of new partnerships, new collaborations between gaming companies and other forms of entertainment, sports, media. So, for example, Travis Scott 
held a concert on Fortnite, and I checked last night, and it, the YouTube video of it had about 64 million views. Uh, Formula One racers competed against each other. The Detroit Lions announced their new play schedule in an Animal Crossing video. NBA players are signed up to do NBA 2K competitions against each other. So a question for you, Don. Do you see this as the new normal? Do you think that we are going to have a lot more collaborations and that given every, that everyone cannot sort of participate in these live events for a certain period of time, this is how we're going to experience media, not only in the near future, but in the far future? I mean, I tend to look back at, you know, I, I, I take a little bit of my opinion on this, on my negativity around the, uh, the prospect for a vaccine. So I have, to, I have to start by saying I'm highly, uh, I, I'm highly negative on something on which we should aspirationally be positive. Um, it's, to me, the, part, the, the kinds of partnership you're describing <clears throat> and the kinds of activities that I think we are going to see a little bit more of emanate from a, uh, em emanate from a situation where what if humans aren't comfortable going and being among other humans? You know, you mentioned when you were giving me my intro quite graciously that uh, last night was, was I, I was I had my birthday. Uh, my wife and I did a thing that I remember from the great before. Um, we went to something called a restaurant, and there were humans in that restaurant as who, who weren't us. Um, and you know, it's, it's it's a weird feeling now when you're out in public and you see humans, and you know the idea of okay, well. What if, you know, in restaurants, like the tables are all, you know, they've they all taken half the tables out. <clears throat> what if that is our new normal and everything feels unusual to people who remember the great before? Um, you know, it's, it, it's the situation of, you know, we never had a vaccine for the bubonic plague, but we don't all get the plague anymore because we brought around societal changes. I think, Chris, some of the things you've described are the kind of societal will start is their consumption of diversionary content into ways that uh, allow them to, to consume it in an environment in which they feel more comfortable and safe. Yeah, and, and, and Nikki, do you have a, a, a different thinking there? What do, you, what do you see as a way that games can help people address the new normal or, or find comfort in, in things that that they used to do and want to still be able to experience. Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, I think our observation was that it's not the new normal so much as it's a, it's a recent normal. Uh, you know, it's been going on for some time, especially you know with esports and um, sports sims, um, these types of partnerships. So you know. Uh, it's, we've been having brands, you know, approach us for a long time in relation to our sports sim uh, football manager, for instance. And I think it's for certain brands and certain games, it's a natural place to sit um, and they're natural collaborations um, that feel natural to our consumers. Um, I think maybe there's a danger of going too far. I think, you know, um, Fortnite is littered with brand associations. It's, you know, from a parent perspective, it looks a bit like an advert now. Um, so I think I think the key for for brands will be to make sure that there's an authenticity in the uh, lineups they do um, that, that that really resonates. Because as Don says, you want to have echoes of your real life within your gameplay and, and vice versa, so that it remains relevant and and engaging. Um, and for free to play games, obviously that's the big pull, isn't it? You know, you you want to get a balance right between lucrative brand partnerships. But also, you don't want to set the teeth of your community on edge by over overplaying it. So, yeah. I think it will continue. Um, but I also think our communities are biggest critics, and they're savvy to this, and they don't want to be oversold. Yeah, so that's that's actually interesting. So, what do you think the thought process would be, or or should be, <clears throat> if you are a publisher and you're looking to, you know, expand the reach of your game, and you're getting um, you know, inquiries left and right from different kinds of, you know, I don't want to say traditional media companies, but, you know, um, sporting events or concerts, and they're looking to do some kind of collaboration. Is there a process that you'd look at to try and figure out what would be best for a particular game or, you know, a, a particular brand or, or, or product of Sega's? 
Is that to me, Chris? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Um, well, I think it's just, yeah, the same as um, as I just said, we're looking for a, a brand synergy that makes sense to, to our c c customers. Um, and something interesting my marketing um, head said to me yesterday was, during lockdown, there's also been a sense of responsibility here. Um, because we have such a direct line of communication now with our consumers, um, we are, you know, we almost have a captive audience. Terrible to say, but you know, they're, 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 with that in mind, um, actually the government reached out to us to to ask us to help with um, some essential messaging around being safe, and particularly trying to target, um, you know, a, a group of, of of the public that were really having difficulties with loneliness and being in lockdown, which are you know teenage males typically. Um, you know, and games have a great reach and a great influence. And so using ad hoardings within Football Manager to, to get out the government's message of stay home, stay, stay safe, was something we were able to do and we're glad to do. Um, now, that's not a brand partnership, but it is, it is a, it's a demonstration of how powerful that collaboration and link between positioning within our games can be, can be really, really very, very useful indeed. Yeah, how about, how about you, Don? How would you approach partnerships or collaborations with um, you know, traditional marketing or traditional media companies and try to bring that into a particular sort of gaming brand or product? I mean, I think you have to look for situations where the synergy would have existed even in the great, be the great before and will continue to exist in the great beyond. Um, and if those synergies would have existed before and been after, then they'll continue to exist now, right? You know, I'll, I'll I'll put myself back in my Pokemon days for a second. Pokemon was never yeah. going to do a partnership with 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 vodka, right? <clears throat> that's that's a brand association that just doesn't ever make any sense. And so, you know, the idea of finding yourself a partnership that makes sense, um, I think, is 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 a highly necessary thing to look at. Is if the partnership doesn't seem to make any sense, it's not going to resonate well with your players and your community. Sure. You know, so as I sit here and I, and I think about partnerships for Bungie, I think to myself, what kind of partners would make sense for us? And those would be the kinds of things that I would that I'd be pursuing. <clears throat> so I wasn't I'm aware, Nikki, of the, uh, of the of the situation with Sega uh, passing on the government guidance. Um, that's a fantastic use of community. Is you know, and a fantastic way to allow your community to know that you are a trusted interlocutor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if one of those came along for me, I would be all over it. Yeah, and I think it was our way of, of it was our way of repaying, you know, the trust and confidence of our community. They, they, they support us during this and we need to support them. So there was very much, uh, it, was, it, was, it was the right thing to do. You know, Don, you could have uh, new Destiny helmets and face masks. And that that would uh, <laughs> that would go a long way. Um, okay. Game up. So. So. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm going to put the, the 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 Destiny and the Fortnite games to one side. Those are you know meant to be um, mass massively played, m multiple players at the same time, collaborative social experiences on on one end of the spectrum. And then you have single-player, story-driven experiences. And it seems like, at least at the moment and probably for the past couple of years, there's been a lot of the, the mass multiplayer games have risen in popularity. And I'm wondering if, if you think in the, in the gaming industry there's still room for these both mass multiplayer online gaming experiences and single-player story-driven experiences. Uh, Nikki, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, I think there is. Um, I think the beauty of, of what, what the industry does is provide a variety of games um, and caters for all, all tastes. And I, 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 I haven't seen anything that would suggest that one's been edged out um, more than the other. Um, you know, you only have to look at sort of the addictive qualities of, of, of very intense um, single player game or uh, singular experience games like Football Manager to understand um, that that's always going to be 25 years later, you know, something that that's um, that's wanted and there's a, a demand for. So no, I mean, uh, again, I think it's the 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 industry's ability to produce 
all of these different experiences um, on different platforms across media is, is, is going to continue. Great. And so I think in the, in the interest of time, Graham, why don't we uh, tee up the next question and I'll let you go ahead and ask that one. Sure, sure. And I've, um, I've switched off my uh, video. We're having some network issues around London today, which, which may affect other people anyway. So I hopefully I'm coming through loud and clear, even though you can't see me. Um, I guess I was going to ask, it's, it's so many individuals using games as a means to socialise with friends and family, particularly how that's increased during lockdown. I guess we've all seen an uptick in politics crossing into gaming for example i suspect we all read about um, in in animal crossing recently um it being banned in china in connection with the hong kong uh, protests and so on and i just wondered obviously that this only affects certain kinds of games and um and some you know won't be touched but i i just wondered maybe starting with don you know has, has this kind of thing had any impact on you has it touched uh, your business or anyone you know Sure. I mean, <clears throat> I was I was around for the for the launch and the and the height of Pokemon Go. So <clears throat> I'll say I imagine that the number of people desperately looking for reasons to go for walks back at the beginning of the lock, the usage of Pokemon Go. So there's that. Uh, certainly, you know, the the discussion of, of politics and gaming um, in the United States right now. Obviously, we're we're experiencing a heightened uh, time of political, uh, what I'll call, interest and unrest. Um, <clears throat> and we just did a large, uh, a large announcement at Bungie on the future of the Destiny 2 game. We started it with an 8-minute and 46-second 40 sec moment, uh, moment of silence uh, for, uh, for George Floyd, um, that being the period of time that the, uh, lo that the police officer was kneeling on his neck um, and so, you know, certainly we haven't been afraid to get ourselves to take a side, I guess. Um, you know, the, the, to me, there's really only one side in this conversation. And I think to our company, there's only one side in this conversation as well. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, we haven't been we haven't been afraid to hide from it um, or to, you know, we haven't we haven't felt the need to try and stay out on the basis that we're afraid that our players will, will believe a different thing than us. Um, you know, we we're we're a company that builds communities, and you can't build a community without people knowing how you feel. Mm. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And uh, Nikki, what about within Sega and the businesses you look after? Yes, and I, I think you know there's a difference between companies um, between what companies do and say in response to, to politics and socio-political events. Um, and allowing the games to be a platform themselves for politicking. Um, you know, I agree with Don. I think y you have to, as a company, go out and say what you believe in, um, especially if your consumers are asking you for a view a viewpoint. I think where where it gets tricky is is when you are a global multi multinational. It's trying to pull together messaging that, that sounds authentic, that that comes out, you know, in the right way with everyone's buy in, and it suddenly becomes an unwieldy sort of beast um um which not necessarily it doesn't that doesn't necessarily sit well with trying to you know um go with with the with the moment really um and with the momentum that some of these sort of seismic societal changes are driving um but that's that's an inevitability i think with being such such a you know a, a corporate beast and also different cultures colliding i think has its added complications but um but the games themselves, you know, we're not on. We don't do online games, so I think the the ability for for, for, for yeah. our players to politic within our games is is limited. Um, but are they equally, you know, vocal on forums and, and vocal on our social media channels, um, and they do demand it. They, and you know, when they see our position, um, it, it, it sort of reinforces that trust and confidence in us as a brand. So. I, I think it's going to continue, and I think I think lockdown um, has made people look inside themselves more anyway and become, you know, ask some really important questions. Um, so I don't think it's going to go away. And I think it's an interesting sort of policy piece for each company now. You know, if you don't have a policy group, why not? And, and you know, I say it to my senior management team, you know, we, we need to have a voice on a lot of these issues now. Um, 
so yeah, I think it's it's prevalent, it's it's timely, it's topical, and it's it's here to stay. And I guess we all saw what happened um, around the U.S. elections in 2016, and the finger pointed at Facebook. And you know, Nikki, you described you know yourself as working for a, a huge publisher. You know, we are you know you are all publishers. Ultimately, do you think that kind of conversation is going to start to creep into the game sector? And I'm, I'm not thinking of the game Sega publishers necessarily, but you know, more community type type games. Do you think, uh, you know, games publishers are going to have to start developing policies on that kind of thing in, in, in a similar way to the way Facebook are scrambling to do so now? Yeah, and I think whether it's driven by your consumers asking you to have a view on it or, again, societal changes that just overtake you, I, I do believe we are going to have to evolve policies. Um, you know, on one side, you've got your rules of engagement with your community. You know, you can do this and you can't do that. And that's very much defined by legal um, parameters. That, that's a safe place for us. We can we can deal with that. Um, and then in between, you've got where, you know, diversity and inclusion initiatives collide with um, with politics or just other policy issues that we want to tackle as, as a business, both for our position as publishers, but also for our staff as well. So uh, that's an area which we are looking to um, to build on. And and again, you know, during lockdown, we've seen DNI channels within the business flourish because um, BLM, as an example, you know, it, it it triggered so many interesting conversations within the business, a lot of anger and a lot of obviously emotional upset. But there were some positives to come out of that, and and you know people deciding that actually this is something they want to make more permanent within the business in, in furtherance of BAME initiatives, um, people sharing literature and, uh, you know, tips for documentaries and films which showcase, you know, just how little we know about our colonial past as an example in the UK. You know, this is all really positive stuff. Um, and I think at some point it does flow into a policy position because it's all learning. Um, and it's all context about the way that we fit into uh, society as as you know, a form of entertainment. Sure, Don, did, did you want to um, add anything there? Sure. I mean, as a member of uh, of Nikki's colonial past myself, um, <clears throat> you know, I I would say that uh, it's been it, this has looked at itself, and you know, the the people involved in it, and the in and. and both on the creative side, the creation side, and on the consumption side, have looked at the looked at the industry and looked at the products and said, "Is this a thing that I that I want to continue to be involved in? Um, is this a way I want to spend my time? Is this an activity that I want to support with my money, etc.? Um, do I want my labor to continue to support this particular business or activity, uh, etc.? And you know, I think I think that's that's something that we're all going to have an opportunity to keep, you know, we, we all have the opportunity to ask ourselves that question every day, but I think this is going to be something where we'll have the opportunity to think about whether or not this is, the, this is the thing for us. Sure. Sure. Absolutely agree. Um, well, again, in the interest of time, so we can move on. Chris, did, uh, should we move on to the next question? I think you were going to ask that. Yes. Yeah. All right, so shifting away from politics and political activism, uh, privacy has been an evolving issue in the legal landscape and has touched multiple industries. Um, do you guys have any perspective or insights as to how it's affected gaming? And Nikki, I'll, I'll start with you. Are there any practices that you'd like to implement, implement but haven't done so because of privacy concerns? Are there certain way that you choose to tackle privacy issues, whether it's user-related or otherwise? Uh, it, it's such a huge subject. Um, all, all and everything of the above, I think, you know, in an ideal <laughs> world, we would we would have had all of our processes and, um, and uh, guidance embedded in the business without any objections or kickback. But uh, in the real world, we have to, um, we have to deal, I think, primarily with the perception that in order to comply with data protection, it's going to hinder the business, stifle innovation and and slow down development to such a slow pace that, that you know, the user experience is completely destroyed. Um, you know, and I think two, two and a half years ago, that was that was where we were starting. And um, 
we we fight the good fight with our DPOs in order just to try and um, lessen the burden and take a lot of that compliance away. But that, that essential message still be, remains hard to embed in the business. The idea of privacy by design and, and um, I wouldn't say there were processes as such that we haven't implemented because of data privacy concerns, but I think we would um, we would say that that we, we haven't been able to achieve as quickly as we wanted to some of the um, things we need to do because of um, because of this perception and and you know the fact that it hasn't really hit home yet that this could be a a financial advantage to the business. It, you know, it will get more trust from our consumers. We will be transparent in our, the way we handle data. Children, you know, parents and children, etc., will feel more supported. So. There's a long way to go with it, um, and you're always working against a very uh, a fast-paced business, uh, where agility is key. Um, and sometimes they just they just don't sit well side to side. Yeah. So, so you mentioned that it could potentially slow down development, and you haven't been able to necessarily introduce certain things that you'd like to. Is is there an example that you're able to share, or something that you've seen that? would be a great idea, but it's just too complicated from the legal perspective to try and sort of figure it out or it's too risky? I can't think of specifics, or if I have got specifics, I'm not going to talk about them right now. But um, <laughs> I think I think I'm, I think I can go as far as saying it's sometimes the, the complexity of data sharing that makes us uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have layers of sub-processes, uh, you have ran very bizarre conversations sometimes with uh, first party about who's a processor and who's a, a controller. Um, mm -hmm. Divergence of laws across the globe, um, vague understanding of GDPR and how it impacts. You know, it, it, there's a long list. Um, but for us sometimes just to unpick quickly enough for the business, for them to jump on a business opportunity, which is scraping data from, from some Facebook lookalike audience or whatever it is, you know, these are, these are big issues and, you know, um, sometimes we, we just need the time, more time to grapple with them. Um, and then and then before you even start to talk about data processing agreements and, and, and the like. So, so, no, I think sometimes it's just not being able to respond quickly enough and, and get through what we need to get through. And so, so, Don, I have a feeling that this is going to be a topic that you're quite passionate about. So do you have any, any thoughts on this one? I, I do have some fairly elaborately developed thoughts on privacy and game development. I mean, I launched a worldwide geolocation app for children um, and managed to do it with no regulatory issues uh, anywhere in the world. And so, you know, I, I tend to look at it as privacy is a challenge in a world where you don't want to inform people. I mean, you know, like I said, I launched a worldwide geolocation app for kids. Uh, if you inform the parents, these are the things that this is that we're going to do. These are the things we're going to need to know. This is why we're going to need to know them. You create what Nikki, I think, correctly uh, described as, as a trust. Um, and if you if privacy is basically a recognition, if, if you if you if you build up trust in your community, they recognize that they can trust you with information. Then privacy isn't a problem. Privacy is just an activity. It's a way of life, right? And so the idea of do you collect information that you don't need? Um, if you do, then why um, they don't understand what you're doing or why you're doing it? That's where you start to have issues that you run into with them. Um, no, nobody complained about us tracking your location in Pokemon Go because they understood. Obviously, you need to know where I am for the game to work. Um, but if it was if it was a game that otherwise didn't need any sort of location information, why do you need to know where I am, right? When you're when you're reading the app permissions in iTunes, in iTunes or in the Google Play, you know at what point do you say, well, why does this app need access to my calendar? You know why does it need to why why do you need to know where I am? And the answer to that is usually because of ad networks. Right? But they won't say, our ad networks require us to find out where you are, and so people get a little bit you know, snaky about that. Um, you know, Coming out of a, uh, a kid's privacy environment and going now into uh, what I'll call a, a grown-up privacy environment, um, 
aside, when you work in kids' properties, you develop the habit of calling things grown up rather than adult because you know there's kids media and then adult media is a different thing than media targeted <laughs> at grown ups. And so you don't you don't tend to contrast yourself to adult media. You tend to contrast yourself to grown up targeted media. So if I use the word grown ups, that's why. Um, so now that I'm in a grown ups environment, the ability to access and track information uh, is a slightly different environment. And you know certainly California has its rules that are coming in um, under the CCPA. Uh, there's obviously the GDPR. Um, I will tell you that if you treat everyone like they're a kid, the GDPR becomes very, very easy to comply with. Um, but that restricts your business abilities in other ways. And so I would say, you know, privacy, the ability to build, a, the ability to build a community and the ability to build a profile is important. But people want to choose how they present themselves online. That's true in gaming, just as in every other environment, you know. I, I think it's true for all of us who have accounts with them that we all curate our Facebook account to present our best selves to the world, right? And so sure. I think that's true in gaming as well. People curate their gaming environment so as to present their best self to the world. And if it's a community in which they want to participate, um, they will want to control how they're perceived, how they're presented, what information about them is shared into the community, et cetera. So it, it sounds like you specifically um, take this concept of privacy by design and, and really implement it at various levels, including sort of asking why you would potentially want to collect certain types of information. And I think that, that echoes, echoes what Nikki said. One thing that, that you did mention, though, is that for um, the, the Pokemon app, that you found a way of informing parents. What, what mechanism did you use to, to achieve that? How did you sort of satisfy yourself that parents were receiving the necessary information to provide kind of valid consent? Well, at Pokemon, uh, what we did was we, we had, uh, you couldn't create a child account without creating an associated parent account. And so we would communicate the information to the parent, uh, either by updated privacy policies or by emails explaining what was going on, et cetera. Um, plain language communications, you know, I, privacy policies, there's all the joke of like, well, nobody ever reads the EULA, nobody ever reads the privacy policy. Um, they just click it because it's, it's a button in the way of the thing they want. Right. Um, the people that read your privacy policy are usually already angry at you. And let's not make them angrier by giving them a bunch of things that they find incomprehensible or that feels like it's obfuscatory. Let's provide them with, with, with actually informative statements and actually informative information. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And, and so, Nikki, if we take this up to a, to a higher level, what do you think the right balance is between what a user's privacy is and should be and the way that gaming publishers or developers should be able to use a user's data? I think I think from the conversations we have with, with our teams is, you know, what is a legitimate expectation? Um, if you put yourself into the consumer shoes, you know, say, echoing what Don was saying, um, you know, there's, there's, there's so much you can do with analytical in-game data. Um, and there are potentially lots of people you could share it with to gain greater insight on predictions, trends, and, and other behaviors, and, you know, wish list conversions, et cetera, et cetera. But I think you have to then tie it back to the individual their expectations when purchasing the game. Um, and that's the right balance. Um, another thing I think is educating the business on retention. It's like this is all, this is feeling that you need to hold everything for as long as possible, just in case. Um, and we've been, you know, trying a lot to get rid of that. Let's get rid of our, let's get rid of all the baggage that we drag along with us. Um, and we, we've had some success with that. And I, it, it's a shift in thinking about the value of data, um, what we need it for, who are we going to share it with and why? And, you know, what would what would Joe Bloggs think about the fact that I might share it? Right. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. All right. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the clock, and we're getting towards the, the end of our scheduled time. So, so, Graham, I'll let you jump in here with the next question. Sure, sure. Well, mine's a reasonably quick, snappy one. Um, we're all really excited about the new consoles set to release later this year. Um, 
but there's some people in the industry who are, you know, taking the view that this is the last generation of consoles. And um, I thought it would be great to get your uh, your take on that, uh, Nikki. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. I referred it to my CRO for his insight. But um, there's, there's a good fact here, which is the PS5 reveal event was the most watched gaming live stream in YouTube's history. It surpassed all previous console reveals at, and E3, and its combined views surpassed 80 million. Um, so, yes, there was quite a bit of excitement about it. Um, so, you know, we don't think this will be the last round of consoles. Um, primarily because of those types of numbers. And, and I think I saw an interesting stat today coming out of the Ofcom Online Nation report um, that, that for the first time has a section on, on gaming, um, for the UK industry at least. And, you know, the, the graphs that they show don't show much of a decrease on purchasing of hardware in the last five years. Some slight shifts, but, but ultimately, you know, men are still buying consoles in quite large numbers in the UK market. Women are buying less and have shifted over to mobile, um, but but certainly there's a you know there's an appetite there for it, um, and also you know the space under the TV is always going to be critical to the likes of Sony and Microsoft. Um, that space is is important to them, and I think that will keep them in the market and keep them creating. Um, but it, but it might be that it's you know it is another six or seven years before the next next round come up next gen. Yeah, well, that was going to be my next question. Don, do you think, do you, do you agree with Nikki's view? Do you have a different take? And do you think it's going to be another six or seven years until we see the PS6, for example? Um, <clears throat> good question. I think, first of all, anybody who thinks consoles are going away should go talk to my old friends at Nintendo, uh, who did all right launching a console last year. Um, and, you know, the, a functionally dedicated de gaming device, uh, I think, as gaming becomes a more accepted mainstream form of entertainment, um, you know, Nikki qu quite correctly described it as the space under the TV, right? That space under the TV will become more and more fought for and more and more and more used by more and more devices and more and more products. Um, in, in a world where people have decided that they're not going to subscribe to cable television anymore um, and they're using it as a streaming box, you know, Microsoft may well have been out way, way ahead of their time, as they often are sometimes, um, with the the TV integrations in the Xbox uh, in, in, in the Xbox One uh, and the Xbox 360 consoles. Um, I think it will be a while be before we'll see a new console because there'll be the need to demonstrate that the new box brings you something that the old box couldn't. And I mean, if you watch that PS the PS5 reveal, the PS5 is able to deliver, you know, ver uh, skipping the uncanny valley level graphics. At which point, what's the PS6 going to bring you? You know, what's what's the point of that device? Now that said, I've got The Last of Us 2 sitting in my PS4 right now, so I can tell you the graphics that the current generation of consoles are able to deliver are pretty damn amazing themselves. Um, and so, you know, it's the question of what is the new processing power of a new console going to deliver you that the old one couldn't? Once that question can be answered, then that's when people will start making the new box. Sure. Well, maybe they'll invent a box that cuts people's hair in lockdown. Some, some, some useful, some useful additional you, purpose. Um, I believe hair is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> Just a shout out to the audience. You've got a Q&A box on your screens. If you do want to add any questions for the end as we wrap up in a few minutes' time, please um, send them in and um, Chris and I can uh, read them out. Chris, I'll hand over to you for, um, for another question. Yeah, sure. So I, I think our, our closing question is going to be a, a, a general one that will just allow our, our, um, our presenters and our panel to sort of express their ideas, you know, what's ahead for your companies uh, for the remainder of 2020? Um, you know, do you have any specifically to the to, to the lawyers um, are, are interested in what legal issues do you think you're going to have to deal with in the short term and maybe in, in the near term based on the products you're developing? You know, I guess give, give us some insights of what you see as uh, the future for your respective companies. Uh, Nikki, why don't you take that one first? 
so, well, so first for, for the remainder of 2020, uh, we'd like to all get back together and see each other again. Uh, we would, um, we'd like to celebrate our 60th birthday. It is Sega's 60th birthday this year. Um, we would like to see Sonic the Hedgehog movie uh, finish its its tour of the world. Uh, I think we were one of the, we were one of the last movies to to get released before shutdown in the US, um, but we didn't didn't quite make it into China for the launch. So and Japan even as well. So we'd like to see that happen, um, celebrate getting back and and do some of the stuff and also celebrate the success um, as as a company together. Um, and I think looking forward, you know. It, We've been diverted, uh, and the politicians are rightly or not rightly. I can understand why they are diverting us away from from what what is on the horizon um, after the transition period at the end of the year. So, I think we have to sort of start thinking about Brexit again, about the impact it will have on the business, um, and start to you know realise that actually, in seven months, and the government doesn't seem to be doing much about transition or. Or, or getting a deal done. So thorny issues on our agenda will be, you know, what do we do in the absence of an adequacy decision on data transfer? Um, and which sort of key processing arrangements do we have to start interrogating um, because of our data flows into Europe? Um, so yeah, Brexit will be will be a hot topic again. <laughs> it seems to have receded for a while, but not for long. Um, and then I think we're just looking forward to some great successes, big releases coming out as well. So we've got, you know, our annual football manager will come out. Uh, there was some there was some discussion about how the football seasons would end this year in order for the game to sort of faithfully replicate um, football seasons. But it looks like we're catching up now, so that'll be all right. Um, and we're really excited about expansion and and investment. Uh, I don't think we've got time to talk about investment in any any great detail, but um, you know we are looking to expand and, and add new IP to the, to Sega Europe's business. Um, and also continue our collaborations with third-party developers um, on publishing deals. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of excitement um, building, and um, and there's a couple of the highlights waiting for us. Sounds, sounds great. How about well, you, Nikki, c considering your movie knocked off my uh, my previous title of having I wasn't going to say it, Don. I, I wasn't going to say it. The most the, the, the best received video game movie. Thanks for the for rubbing my face in it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the box office figures if you want me to uh, no. No, no need no need to remind me of those. It's okay. Uh, I, I congratulations on not launching the week after Avengers. Thank you. <laughs> it's uh, and, and I had actually forgotten football manager is one of your guys' games. Um, that's uh, yeah, that's a fantastic uh, fantastic title. Um, I do think that uh, you know the, the the discussion around let's think about what the great beyond looks like. Is a, is a good one for us all to think about. Um, you know, you, you, I imagine still front of mind for, for folks in the UK is the, the joys of Brexit. Um, I was in charge of Brexit planning for Pokemon, so I'm very glad to have left that particular responsibility of my old job behind me. Um, Bungie is looking at doing some international expansion, um, and, you know, thanks to Brexit, we're having to look at uh, some of the countries in continental Europe. Um, as well as uh, you know, opening an office in, J in Japan to cover APAC and things like that, um, and so certainly I, I think you know I think the uh, the Bungie model of self-publishing the game in the new console environment is something that I think we we may see a lot more of, and so I think these you know these are the kinds of things that we're gonna that we're gonna see going forward. And I'm sorry, so I know that uh, Graham wanted to wanted to come in, so I'll, I'll shut up. Uh, no, no, I think that was fascinating. Um, well, I'm, I'm mindful of the time. Um, we've used our allotted hour. I've certainly found it a very entertaining form of social distancing. Uh, I think we've, I do hope we've fulfilled the brief for everybody joining in the, the audience as well. And so thank you for everyone who joined to, uh, to listen. Thank you to Chris and all the team at Wilson Sonsini for um, supporting this and presenting with us, but particularly thank you to Don and Nikki for your thoughts, your insight, for only mentioning Brexit a few times um, on the last question. And uh, Nikki, I, 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 I do hope there's a big party for the 60th birthday. I hope there's no social distancing when it takes place and that everybody can really get together to celebrate that properly face-to-face. 
And in the meantime, Don, I, I don't know whether it's the other side we're going to or the great beyond. I guess nobody knows. But um, just once again, thank you very much, everybody, for joining and for your thoughts and insight. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks. And thanks to our, thanks, our wonderful thanks. panel. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.